ridiculous. I'm meeting Pierre. Uh, are you sure? Of course I'm sure. He telephoned me. Zero, get back! On this episode of Old Joe's Reminiscence, a revolutionary and his fiancée, who just happens to be the president's daughter, are exiled and living in Paris following a failed coup d'etat. When the radical suddenly disappears, it's up to C.R. Grover to track the man down. Doug McClure stars. I'm reviewing the final episode of Search, a show that was my absolute favorite series in the early 1970s. Although some of the Search episodes would appear in reruns throughout the summer months of 1973, The Packagers was the very last of the first run episodes to air in the United States. NBC's first broadcast of this episode was on Wednesday, April 11th, 1973. This was following a hiatus of one week because NBC decided to air a couple of specials on April 4th of that year. They started out with Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Tree, always one of my favorites, followed by Elvis, Aloha from Hawaii an edited version of a live concert that was originally broadcast on January 14th opposite the Super Bowl. The highest rated program of the year for the network apparently featured Elvis Presley singing songs such as Blue Hawaii while showing shots of breaking waves, hula dancers, and some Hawaiian island waterfalls. But getting back to search, the supporting cast and the darker Probe Control Studio are indications that this is another holdover, an episode that was filmed before the mid-season reset. If you have yet to see this final episode, or if you've simply forgotten what it's all about, grab your DVD set and take a look before I unwrap The Packagers. Once again, as usual, the teaser does absolutely nothing to jog my memory, so let's dive right into the episode. We open with an aerial view of a city, and then some stock footage of an air and ground assault, including some short clips that we've already seen during the probe pilot film. A soldier is shown being escorted from a building at gunpoint, with his hands behind his head. Well, Karim, your little coup d'etat is over, and so is your wife. He's about to be executed when a jeep pulls up. Major, not without a trial. Sura, stand aside. Please, father, don't kill him, I love him. He's a traitor. He will be tried and he will be executed. If he is, then on that day I will die with him. The president sentences the couple to permanent exile. At the darker probe control with its multitude of technicians, BCR Cameron, played by Burgess Meredith as usual, is briefing probe agent C.R. Grover. Now this flight climax, the end of a bloody revolt, led by a Lieutenant Pierre Karim. Karim is played by Michael Pataki. Michael Pataki was born on January 16, 1938 in Youngstown, Ohio. He attended USC, where he majored in drama and political science. 
he appeared in a few minor uncredited roles in films as early as 1958. But it was a summer stock festival in 1966 that really pushed him forward. His acting career took off with his numerous guest appearances on television in the mid-1960s. One of his most famous roles was as Korox, the Klingon who started the bar fight on Star Trek's The Trouble with Tribbles episode. He was the co-star of Get Christy Love in the mid-1970s. He also appeared in movies such as Airport 77 and Rocky IV. In addition to his film and television appearances, Michael provided voices for animated productions. He also directed the 1977 film version of Cinderella. Michael Pataki died on April 15, 2010 at the age of 72. I barely recognized him without his Klingon makeup. You're right. He's plot against President Sinjar barely failed. That failed coup attempt was against sitting President Alejandro Sinjar, played by Titos Vandis. Titos Vandis was born in Greece on November 7, 1917. The Greek actor did a lot of appearances on American television beginning in the 1960s. He was in the running to play the Bond nemesis Goldfinger. His final roles were in his home country of Greece. Titos Vandis died on February 23, 2003 in Athens. For the past 18 months, Pierre Karim has shared permanent exile with the president's daughter. Until 10 days ago in Paris, when Karim vanished from the face of the earth. And the French police have failed to find a trace of him. He's presumed kidnapped. Correct. No, there have been no demands. Uh, that clenches him. Why? Well, Karim's dead. The good president obviously had him wasted. But then Sinjar is also wasting a very large amount of money because he is our client. Oh. CR flies off to Paris where he poses as a newspaper reporter in order to gain an interview with Zura Sinjar, played by Xenia Gratzos. Xenia Gratzos was born in Athens, Greece on February 12, 1940. She is better known by the name Brioni Farrell, only acting under her birth name in the mid-1970s. She did the run of The Man from UNCLE, Star Trek, Mission Impossible, Bonanza, Death Valley Days, Colombo, The Bionic Woman, Fantasy Island, General Hospital, and Dallas, to name a few. Brioni Farrell died in California on August 8, 2018 at the age of 78. Zora tells Grover that Kareem had gone to get the papers, and when he returned he suddenly decided to take a ride in the country. I thought it strange at first. But nothing more, until I realized we were being followed. Followed? By a gray fiat. Did you see who was in it? Oh, two men. I never saw them clearly enough for identification. She thinks that he was captured or maybe killed. Well, tell me something. How did you get away? The gray car crashed into a limousine. That gave us just enough time to turn a corner. And then Pierre insisted I get out. For my own safety, of course. Grover asks when and where the accident with the limo happened, and Cam has the team tap into the French police records to find that the limousine involved belonged to British Brigadier General Lionel B. Harbison, played by John Holland. John Holland was born in Nebraska on May 16, 1908. His film career dates back to 1937, the year he played minor roles in five motion pictures. Other than a five-year gap during World War II, John found steady employment in the movie and television industry as a supporting cast member. He appeared in scores of productions, often playing the part of a military or authority figure. John Holland died on May 21, 1993. He was 85. There is a handsome green limo parked in the drive at the general's estate but the man claims to know nothing of an accident. He calls for Craig, his driver. Craig, will you be so good as to report here on the double? Yes, sir. It's never explained if Craig is the man's first name or his last name. He's only credited as Craig, 
played by Londoner John Orchard. John Orchard was born in London on November 15, 1928. He first appeared on film in 1952 and he had dozens of credits before his retirement in the late 1980s. He played a lot of small roles on film and television and he appeared as a recurring character during the first season of M.A.S.H. in the early 70s. John Orchard died on November 3, 1995 in London. Craig admits to being in a collision when he took the general's motor without permission. The general's transport was struck by a French vehicle, sustaining minor damage to the right wing, which has now been repaired, sir. He identifies the other driver as Ian Ferrant, who has also disappeared. But I'm trying to uh, locate Ian Ferrant. Oh, really? Yes. I think he knows what happened to Lieutenant Corinne. I get the feeling that the general knows more than he's letting on. My gut feeling is backed up in short order by the music swell and confirmation by probe control that the man had a strong reaction when Grover mentioned the accident. I thought the general nearly popped his pips. That's quite right. We got a reading of increased adrenaline flow. When CR returns to his car, which isn't his Corvette, by the way, he finds a note on the windscreen. What is that? Traffic citation. Where is Kareem? Is he dead? What is the truth for answers to these and other questions? Come to 57B on Passe des Valeurs Tristes tonight at 10 p.m. If that doesn't sound like a setup, I don't know what would. I remember Nick Bianco's phone call in the middle of the night when he was in Paris. CR heads down some stairs that look to be the ones from the back entrance to Pam's photo parlor from episode 17, the Clayton Lewis document. Grover hears something. We see a man in a stocking mask. That's never a good sign. CR climbs some stairs and finds a body slumped face down on a landing. The masked man takes a couple of shots at Grover, who plays dead for a moment before getting back up. He gives chase when he hears the man running up the stairs. Grover follows, but the man goes back down. How many staircases does this building have? When the man exits, Grover climbs out a window and jumps to a nearby ledge. He watches as the man unscrews the silencer from his pistol and places both in his pockets. I was expecting him to jump on the man like he did when he was in India. Grover accidentally knocks some loose mortar from the ledge, giving away his position. The gunman runs across the street for a better look. He's about to shoot at Grover when he suddenly remembers his silencer. Really? He screws the silencer back onto the barrel, and he's once again about to take a shot at Grover, who's a sitting duck on that ledge. This time, a truck lumbers down the street at that exact moment. The gunman attempts to hide his weapon until the truck passes. He notices Grover leaping from his perch, and he quickly fires a shot before Grover lands in the back of the vehicle. Grover breathes a sigh of relief as he collapses in a stack of papers to end the act. By the time Grover gets back to the murder scene in Act 2, the coroner is already loading the body into his meat wagon. membership in a very exclusive club, the Officers Corps of President Sinjar's Air Force, which as you recall included Lieutenant Kareem. I was right then, Cam. Kareem is dead. A trip to the morgue with Zura negates CR's theory. The morgue inspector in this scene is played by Belgian-born Roger Etienne. He's played bit parts in scores of film and TV productions, 
usually appearing as a French soldier or as an inspector. Back at the general's place, Craig is taking a bow breeding from his employer for letting the pesky journalist get away. Fifteen years of training and you couldn't kill one stupid journalist. Craig argues that he did the main job, which was to kill Ferrant. So Craig was the man in the stocking mask. I would have thought that his mustache would have shown more through that, though. I want nothing left of him to be traced back to me. The next morning, VCR Cameron holds an actual alarm clock to his microphone to awaken Grover. I love how they always seem to add these playful moments, especially in the Grover episodes. Your breakfast has been ordered, and I hope that it is better than mine. Cam has ordered breakfast for CR, and he has some news. Kareem is plotting a return from exile. While Grover listens to Cam's news, room service delivers his breakfast. And I'm thinking there has to be an important reason for this scene. Is the breakfast poisoned? Probably not. The score isn't ominous enough for that. I have the fog. What? Say again, please. I have the fog yes. CR takes a bite of his croissant and he locates another note. Another trap, perhaps? Do you have another probe assigned to this case? Certainly not. And who's feeding me this information? Lieutenant Kareem telephoned Miss Sinja. They will rendezvous at 11 a.m. in the Bois de Boulogne on the bench located one half kilometer west of the children's garden. He takes Zura's place on the bench, waiting for Karim to show up. I think Pierre will notice the difference between Zura and CR. Cam is going over possible scenarios with Grover, and I'm worried that something will happen to the girl who's waiting alone in the woods, unguarded. Then, a man dressed like a beatnik or stereotypical French artist shows up. I'm a friend. I mean, I'm a friend of a friend. Zura sent me. Where is she? She's over there. She's waiting to see if everything's all right. Then the two sit to talk. Meanwhile, Zura is getting nervous. She heads in the direction of the bench. A grenade hits the ground near the men, just as she calls out to her fiancé. When they return to the bench, Kareem is gone. Back at Zura's place in Act 3, Grover shushes her. She says, I will not be quiet. He's looking for a bug, and he finds it in the lamp. He plops the listening device into a nearby fish tank, neutralizing it. Next, Cam and the team look for the listening post. Kiroda, Ramos, get a fix on Contact. In the next scene, Grover sneaks up on a man who's wearing headphones. Peace, friend. Peace. We're on the same side. My friends don't try to frag me. Grover tosses the guy against a wall. 
He's Maruk, played by James Almanzar, another actor who played a lot of small parts. If I had to guess, I'd say that this was the guy who shot at Grover at the end of Act 1. His facial features are a better match to what I saw under the distortion of the stocking mask. And this leaves me wondering if there was a script revision after that scene was shot. Everything has gone wrong. What is the mission? To assassinate Krim, right? No, just merely to keep him under observation to learn his plans. He says that he and Ferrant were keeping surveillance on Kareem, following him in that fiat when the limo rammed them. Are you telling me the limousine ran into you? With deliberation. And Farhat was injured, so I had to take him to the hospital. Grover sets his sights now on the general. He sneaks in at night. The place seems to be well lit. An armed soldier comes down the stairs, sending Grover running for cover. That soldier stops to get a bottle of liquor from a cabinet. Grover was hiding behind the other door of that very same closet. Grover moves to a closed door. He holds his scanner up so that Cam and the folks at Probe Control can see through the keyhole. Now that's a cool effect. They see men smoking and drinking, but Lieutenant Pierre Karim is not among them. Next, Grover heads upstairs. Through one set of double doors, he discovers a room full of guns, maps, and a war games computer. This guy's still playing war games. Or is it games? It's in code. Now that's carrying make believe to extremes. I think we'll let our Mr. Griffin have a look at it. Well, it appears to be a variation of the Lieben cipher, named, of course, by the Canadian fan de Lieben, the outstanding Dutch cartographer. Well, the question of the hour, Mr. Griffin, is can you crack it? I think so. It's quite simple, actually. Uh, look, you guys play word games. I'm getting out of here. You still haven't found Kareem. Grover is on his way back out of the room when General Harbison enters. Oops! Grover tries to make a hasty getaway, but he's stopped by Craig and his gun. They seek Grover at the war desk and they have lots of questions. Like, how did he get in there? Why is he there? Is he there to kill Kareem? I, I came to rescue him. Rescue him? Well, he is a prisoner, isn't he? At least that's what his fiance thinks. I think, General, that we should let Craig have him for a while. Uh-oh. This certainly is an unexpected turn of events from Grover's point of view, but certainly not unexpected for us, especially if we paid any attention to the opening teaser. I don't know why I even watch the teasers. But that's a moot point now that we're on the final episode. Cam reads a coded message, and he informs Grover about the plan to overthrow the Sinjar government. They throw a restraint around Grover, covering his scanner. He's only able to respond to a few of Cam's questions via his dental contacts before his captors administer a knockout drug. begins at Probe Control Headquarters, where the team is trying to re-establish contact with C.R. Grover. They hear the General and Lieutenant Kareem discussing what they're going to do with Grover. You'll be flying over open sea, won't you? Shove the fellow out, for heaven's sake. Grover comes to, next to Zura, aboard an aircraft.
Cam informs Grover of Kareem's intentions to throw him from the airplane. You might as well know the worst, Mr. Grover. Kareem has no intentions of letting you live. He's going to drop you out of that plane without a parachute. Shucky has a plane. Zura assures him that he'll be released once they get back home. Kareem promised. Has he always kept his promises? Or has he married you? Ouch. She sulks off to find another seat. And this is the first I've noticed that she's wearing a nice outfit for flying. Cam says that they're over the Mediterranean, and right on cue, a soldier comes back for Grover. Colonel Green wants to see you now. Colonel? Grover suggests that he must have given himself a battle promotion. On his way to his destiny, Grover pauses to say goodbye to Zura, who has tears in her eyes. Kareem tells Grover that he's disappointed that CR never wrote that story about him. He knows that Grover doesn't work for Worldview. I doubt that you're even a journalist. He suspects CIA, or maybe a paid assassin of Sinjar. When Kareem says, get him out of here, one of his men starts to open a door. Grover causes a distraction by hitting the soldier closest to him. They struggle for a moment until Zura comes into the compartment and says, Kareem lets Grover live for now. His excuse given to his men is that she'll win supporters for us. Zura apologizes and Grover pumps her for information about where they're likely to land, etc. She supposes it's going to be an abandoned airfield. I'm guessing that's the Mojave Desert Storage Facility near State Route 14, because I noticed a railroad and a highway in the distance. If they were shooting this today, they could digitally edit that out with CGI. But it was 1972 and I doubt that anyone even noticed those things on a 25-inch CRT screen. The plane does a flyover, and troops board a couple of transport vehicles. When the plane touches down, it taxis to the waiting troops. Kareem calls for Zura. Grover moves to stand, but he's pushed back into his seat. As Kareem starts down the air stairs, machine gun fire comes from the troop transports, stopping them. Once again, President Sinjar arrives riding in the back of a jeep. Kareem shows what a true coward he is. He uses Zura as a human shield, and he runs back into the airplane. As they're taking off, Grover overpowers the soldier who's guarding him, and he goes after Kareem. Grover turns Kareem over to the rightful regime, and Zura runs to Daddy. Grover tells Cam that he expects two weeks off with pay in the Riviera for a job well done. But Cam reminds him that he has some unfinished business with General Harbison back in Paris. This episode and the series ends with Zura introducing Grover to her father. So once again, I enjoyed this episode of Search, but I had no memories of ever having seen it before. I've really enjoyed viewing most of them, and I can see why I really liked them back in the 70s, enough to remember the series, if not the specific episodes. If you liked this review, remember to tap the like button. And be sure to check out my previous search reviews. I've done them all now. Go back and watch any of the ones you might have missed. Also, tap the subscribe button and activate the notification bell so you'll know when I add more search content as well as upcoming specials and series. I have some ideas for a few short specials on search and someone suggested that I do an episode ranking video. So, we shall see. Stay tuned. Until next time, save it!